All right. So why don't we actually start with any questions that were lingering from before? But if those questions are, are questions I'm about to answer by continuing, well, I'll just I'll brush them aside if that's okay with you. But go ahead. Any questions? Go ahead. Um, I had a question about um, how you said when the dark photon mass goes to zero, this interaction turns off. Um, so at energies higher than the dark photon mass, I assume this interaction will not happen. Um, so I'm wondering if this is compatible with uh, like a freeze out mechanism. In terms of like production in the early universe. So just the dark photon by itself with a small mass term um, is often used to generate a dark matter model. If, so if the mass is light enough, um, then you can have a cosmologically long-lived dark photon. And there you can build dark matter models where the dark photon can give rise to dark matter through oscillation from just the standard model plasma in the universe. You can also get it from like misalignment from, from inflation. There's other production mechanisms like that. Um, but, but essentially, you're populating the dark matter in some of these cases just through, through oscillations from this, this mass mixing term. Okay. I don't think I understood the question. What's say again? So, I mean, considering some higher dimensional operators other than the four, non normalized coupling. So oh. Uh, no, 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 no. So, the, so, so this, this statement definitely does not, is not some general statement of higher dimension operators and so forth. Yeah. Now, admittedly, the higher dimension operators are all suppressed at low energies. Go ahead. So if I include the order epsilon squared terms, I think this is actually the term that I dropped. But there's, as I, as I sort of go along, the epsilon squared terms aren't going to be so simple always, and I want to drop them. But this, this is going to preserve a zero eigenvalue. If you include, if you include every, you're probably just wondering if you took this matrix and you calculated its determinant, it's not zero. So you're like, there's going to be a, you're going to break both gauge groups naively. But this will fix that. And that's, that's, that's going to persist. There's going to be the one direction that'll be preserved. But I really want to drop these order epsilon squared terms later on, okay? Good. What can we say about dark sectors that only interact via gravity? Okay. Um, So late in the universe, in the era that we live in, um, that really limits our options, is the, is, is the bottom line. Now, early in the universe, say in the era of inflation, um, you could still have interesting effects occur where you, where you, I mean, you could still build models of dark matter where you can explain the origin from things like inflation and populating the dark sector through inf the inflaton. Um, that's all fine, but you're not going to, be able to easily build a dark matter model where you explain, say, the dark matter abundance if it's in a dark sector via standard model interactions that way, because gravity is just not strong enough. Not only would a dark sector not reach thermal equilibrium, but even mechanisms like Friesen would not be enough to populate a dark sector with, with uh, an appropriate abundance. I'm not sure if that's what you were asking, but. Yeah, but I mean, like, okay, dark sector, which does, is not necessarily dark matter, it's just some set of particles. Yeah. The, yeah, we're 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 in serious. We're not gonna we're not going to see it that way. Now, there are a few interesting. So the kinds of things you would think about would be um, 
So one example might be that if you had if you had a dark sector that supported non-trivial structure, like their own you know compact objects, um, or say topological defects that could undergo you know violent decay or violent you know perannihilation, you might you might fit for the possibility of detecting exotic gravity wave signals that way. Okay. Um, there is a little bit of there's a little bit of research along those lines, but there's nothing particularly striking in that direction that leads to you know in your face signals the way that this stuff does. But I mean that's the kind of direction you would fish for. And I mean just from what I said, you might gather that the sort of that's a limited set of possibilities for dark sectors that could stand a chance to generate signals just purely through 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 gravity that way. That being said, gravity wave physics is coming into its own. So any such possibilities like that that exist and are calculable are certainly interesting. OK, anything else before we move on? Go ahead. Um, I have a question about uh, unification that you're talking about earlier. Um, is there some a priori reason to think that a new symmetry should be U1, or is that just the simplest case? That's the simplest case. Okay. And in the case of accidental engaging of accidental symmetries then of the standard model for which there's you know b minus l is a global u1 then that's what motivates the u1 in that particular case the others is just simplicity largely i mean we could we could talk about again it's not my it's not my cup of tea but we could talk about string constructions in that context where you could try to provide a more principled rationale for why u1s and even multiple u1s um, but I don't, I don't have a, a simple answer in that direction. OK. All right, I think we left off here. And I think at the level of, at the level of just the Lagrangian, this should make it clear that in this basis, it makes it clear that in the limit of a massless A prime, in the absence of nothing else, we have a decoupling. OK. Now, I was going to say a thing or two about the oscillation physics, but uh, quite frankly, the oscillation physics is a little bit subtle. Um, and, I, and even I get confused about it. Um, well, it's not that surprising that I get confused about it, but it, it's applicable primarily in the, you know, in the early universe where it's not just a simple matter. So like in neutrino physics, right, if you have, or in any other quantum mechanical system where you have mass mixing like this, you're, you're probably familiar with, you know, you produce an interaction eigenstate, and then the Hamiltonian propagates it in a way where the interaction eigenstates oscillate, and the oscillation is controlled by a mass difference. And you end up with an oscillation that's controlled by a mass difference times some baseline length or a time parameter divided by an energy. Right? This is just sort of a typical two-state system in quantum mechanics. In practice in these models, where it's most important is in the early universe, where plasma effects become important, and then and then the actual oscillation physics involves a plasma frequency, effective photon mass, and so forth. So maybe, maybe we, could, we can come back to this in a later lecture, but it's not, it's not totally trivial. So let's go back to the other, the other way of, of removing the kinetic term. Right, so... <clears throat> Okay, so in this case, and this is the way, this is what is usually done. So this will diagonalize the kinetic terms and the mass terms. What you're left with is a coupling of the dark photon to the electromagnetic current of the standard model. OK? So now we have a familiar Lagrangian that's diagonal in its kinetic and mass terms, so we know what to do with that. 
and the effective interaction is just in the coupling here. Okay. Now, this ignores this electroweak piece that I'll come back to. All right. Now, part of the reason I wanted to drop order epsilon squared terms, by the way, is that really what we have going on here is a three by three system, right? We have a dark photon, we have a hypercharge uh, vector, and then we have a neutral Z. And so there's a three by three system that we're diagonalizing. If I ignore order epsilon squared, then I can cheat, and I can actually, I can just talk about the two by two systems one at a time. I could talk about the dark photon photon, and then I can talk about the dark photon Z, and I can just remove them one at a time. Okay, go ahead. Um, I think I would expect with this field redefinition um, for the standard model photon to acquire an effective mass. Is that in that current future? No, this, there is, there's not, an effective, there's not effect, an effective mass that's generated. So that, these field redefinitions all preserve the, uh, the determinant of the mass matrix, which is zero. Okay, now I'll have more to say about the physics of this in a second, but let's actually go back because we're, 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 I just mentioned the Z boson. Okay, so remember, so we have, we have this term that we've been dropping. It has a field strength for the Z hitting the field strength for the dark photon. So there's a prime here, right? So this field redefinition of the photon, which diagonalized the photon dark photon part, didn't touch the, um, didn't touch, didn't touch this piece. Okay, so this was left alone. But the effect of Lagrangian for this piece now, if we now just focus on the dark photon Z part, okay, so just to be clear, so we still have this. After, after one, above. Okay. And so now let's look at the A prime Z. Uh, kinetic, well, this is just the, yeah, it's just gonna be the kinetic plus mass terms. So the Lagrangian contains so I'm just, I'll port over the piece from the dark photon field strength. We have the Z, I apologize for the notation because I'm going back and forth between Z as a vector and Z as a field strength. So I'll write it like this just to make clear what I mean by that. We have epsilon over two tinge theta, theta weak. Let me call this, I'm gonna call this um, epsilon tilde, just to abbreviate notation. We have the dark, Photon mass, and, of course, and now unlike the previous case that we considered, there's of course a mass for the Z boson. So again, I apologize. There's a Z mu nu here, and this will just be a Z Z mu Z mu. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay, so that, that goes right here. Thank you for that. And then we have our electromagnetic current coupling. And now we're going to want to pay attention to the Z bosons coupling to the standard model neutral current, the weak neutral current, okay? And I'm, I'm just, I'm ignoring everything else in the standard model that doesn't involve the dark photon and the neutral current coupling. 
Good to see. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, let me ask. Can you read this? Because I, I was going to switch boards in a second. Or would you like me to? Okay. Well, I can try to keep to the center boards for the much of the remainder of the lecture, if that would help the people on the two sides. Um, I will have to erase more frequently, but that's okay. Yeah, so I can double the sides. I'm just worried. I'm worried that won't totally solve the problem given the angle here. Also, the sides kind of get cut off. Yep, I noticed that too, and it was pointed out. So I'll, I'll try to. Yeah. Okay. Start with this board here. But let me just ask, in all seriousness, how many people just? I just before, because I can write it again. Is it, did, how many people on this side just can't see this? Okay. So I want to just make sure you, you can follow. So let's do this again. And then I can correct my mistake. This is what I was calling epsilon tilde. We've got our mass terms for the dark photon and the Z boson. We've got the coupling of the dark photon to the electromagnetic current we derived. And then we've got, uh, we're going to keep track of the neutral current coupling to the Z boson here. OK, and I, I apologize for that. I think I will, uh, I'll try to write a little larger. But, I realize, but I'll, I'll see if we can just stick to the middle for a bit. Okay, so once again, we have a situation where we want to make our uh, Lagrangian diagonal in its kinetic terms. Uh, we could go through the same exercise we did before and, and try a couple of different field definitions, but let's do the one that puts everybody in diagonal form. So just to set this up, the, just to make it clear what's going on here, there's a kinetic term here. If I just if I were to write it in uh, schematically in matrix form, right? We have a two by two matrix here for the kinetic terms. I'm suppressing the indices and the derivatives. Okay, so let's call this the K matrix. We have a mass matrix that's diagonal. And so, of course, we want to do a field redefinition that preserves let's call this M. Okay, so we want to preserve the uh, mass matrix 
and make the kinetic matrix diagonal. Okay, I'll write, I'll write huge over here, just to see if that helps. So I'm not gonna go through um, the otherwise fairly elementary math here, but just, just to set it up. Okay, so let's go ahead. This is not gonna be a rotation. But we'll, we can apply a field redefinition to define fields A tilde and Z tilde prime, such that N transpose KN is 1, 1, and such that N transpose M, N is diagonal. And after a little bit, you can convince yourself that this can be carried out with a field redefinition that to order epsilon squared is the identity plus a purely off diagonal piece that is not symmetric, mind you, so we can look for a solution of the form to n2 with n12 and 2, 1, order epsilon. Okay, and what you find, well, I'm gonna write this. So N12 is epsilon tilde MZ squared over, is this big enough for the folks over there? Okay. I think the bigger problem is the white background, but uh, And then N21 is minus epsilon tilde MA prime squared over N MZ squared minus MA prime squared. Okay. So just to, uh, I probably didn't need to, we can write this down just so you know how to do the field redefinition, but what, what this means is that in our Lagrangian, we're gonna make the substitution that A prime is gonna to go to A prime tilde plus epsilon tilde MZ squared over MZ squared minus MA prime squared times Z tilde. Right, so there's gonna be an order epsilon tilde shift into the Z. And then the Z is going to need to shift by epsilon tilde. And now it's an MA prime squared over MZ squared minus MA prime squared, A tilde, okay, oops, okay. So that field redefinition should make everything diagonal. And now note what happens. So again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop the order epsilon squared terms. I have been doing that consistently throughout. And so these interaction terms, these two, all right, we can just plug in our shift into these two terms. You can verify that the kinetic terms will be diagonalized and the mass terms will remain diagonal. They'll receive order epsilon squared corrections though. And then the interaction Lagrangian will then contain now I'm gonna keep the tildes when I write the equation when I write write this here, and then I'm gonna drop tildes going forward. So the dark, the new dark photon in the diagonal basis continues to have its order epsilon coupling to the electromagnetic current. Now we have this G weak epsilon over two tan theta weak. And now we have an MA prime squared over MZ squared minus MA prime squared. 
coupling of the dark current to the standard model neutral current. Okay. And then we have G weak. plus order epsilon squared. Okay. Okay, so this is this is the piece that's typically ignored. Dark photon also couples to the neutral current. Now, why is it ignored? It's ignored because of this factor here. That this coupling to the neutral current in the limit of a small dark photon mass is suppressed by MA prime squared over MZ squared. Okay? That's the principal reason it's ignored. But, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, so I mean, I shouldn't be divided. I mean, yeah, so if, if, you, if you get near the resonance region, um, then the mixing is maximal. I mean, this formula breaks down in that case. So the analysis I'm doing here is assuming that I'm away from that resonance region. Okay, so we have all that we need now to define what I'll just call the minimal dark photon model. So the minimal dark photon model is, uh, did I leave anything out up there? I guess I, if you were to add back in the photon, we would have all of the terms we need. So minimal dark photon model has two parameters. We have epsilon, which is the kinetic mixing, and then we have our dark photon mass. Okay. In addition, we've just derived the low energy coupling. So at the, we have electromagnetic current couplings with vertex to the dark photon. And then we have our Feynman diagrams now for neutral current couplings, where this has a, I already, I wrote it above, but just for completeness, I'll write it one more time. G weak, and in the limit of MA prime much less than MZ, I'm just going to approximate this as MA prime squared over MZ squared. This was not very legible. That's that vertex. So we will often work in the limit of dark photon mass, light compared to the Z mass. Go ahead. Um, so with the, I think with the standard model photon, I can see how you could extend this time diagram and mix into the standard model photon. Uh, can the same thing happen with these? Is it the same diagram, pretty much? Sorry, can, yeah, you mean, um, sorry, just say your question one more time. Uh, yeah, so um, I can see how like the dark photon Um, will the diagram with the Z look the same? Yeah, I mean, essentially, this is including this is including the induced dark photon Z mixing that you get from kinetic mixing that's coming from hypercharged kinetic mixing. Um, so that's that second diagram is including that effect there. Okay, I'm not going to say that much about the detailed phenomenology, but the important thing to know about this minimal model. is that the dark photon, by virtue of this kinetic, inter uh, kinetic mixing interaction, is, is um, essentially unstable. So if we 
put the MA prime mass on this axis. So there's sort of a dividing line around an MeV. Really what I mean by this is twice the electron mass. So let's see. Can you see this? OK. OK, all right. So at masses below, well, let's start with the easy case. The easy case are masses above the electron threshold. So that interaction term means that if I produce a dark photon, it can decay to E plus E minus. It could decay to mu plus mu minus if it's as I move up in mass, you know, pi plus, pi minus, et cetera, right? And eventually other types of mesons. So these decays, these decays are all, their partial widths are all controlled by, um, by epsilon. So you'll basically have a partial width that parametrically scales Parametrically, it scales like alpha epsilon squared ma prime squared. This is a proportional to. I am suppressing kinematic factors. Okay, But what this means is that for all intents and purposes, unless epsilon is rather small, and it can be small, I can, and I'll explain that later, uh, these decays are relatively prompt. In other words, the a prime is not, it's not stable. It's just going to decay away very quickly if, you ever, if it's ever produced. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. This, this, I'm sorry. So FF bar, these are standard model for me on pairs. Okay. Right. So this is this is what I just wrote here. So F F F bar is a stand-in for e plus e minus mu plus mu minus pi plus pi minus. Okay. Just to be computation. Go ahead. What? What are you pointing to? The width? That width? Jeez. Oh, no, what I wrote was not dimensionally consistent. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. Please, this is probably not the only mistake I've made in these lecture notes. So, you know, uh, feel free to correct me. OK. Um, so relatively prompt decays above an MeV. Now, if we get down below an MeV, there are no charged particles for an A prime to decay into. There are, however, decays to uh, neutrinos. Okay. So this is through the neutral current mixing. You can't read this anyway, so I'm going to I'll minimize what I write. So there's a decay to, to nu nu bar that comes from the uh, neutral current mixing. But it's no longer just suppressed by um, oh, I see. That's just from washing the board. The slimy on the underside. It's interesting. Um, it's not just suppressed by um, epsilon squared, right? It's going to receive an additional suppression by uh, the weak scale, right? So we have an ma prime squared over mz squared, and in fact, in the width. It'll be that coupling squared. So it'll be very suppressed decay. And so for um, a good fraction of the perimeter space at low A prime masses, this decay width would have led to a cosmologically long-lived dark photon. But there's another decay that can happen as well. So uh, we can have, so again, I'm, I'm, this is all for down here, low masses. We can go through loops of charged particles. So this is a standard model loop. Sorry. I'm going to make it huge. And now, once we're below, say, the neutrino threshold, there's only one particle we can put into the final state here, and that's a photon. And it can attach to these fermion lines. So you can attach one, two. You might have guessed that this is the first one. So there's a. It has a name. It's called the Landau-Yang theorem. So a, uh, 
a vector, either ma a masked vector cannot decay to two massless vectors is essentially the content of that theorem. Um, that's a fun little exercise to carry out at the operator level. It's not that hard to convince yourself of this. So the, the first decay that can happen is to three photons. Okay. And I'll just write the name because people sometimes refer to this. So Landau Yang implies A prime to gamma gamma, not allowed, or really it just vanishes. Okay. Now, of course, so this is epsilon squared suppressed. It's loop suppressed. It has three power, you know, total of four powers of alpha. So that's also a fairly long decay mode. Sorry, small partial width. So the end result here is that above an MeV, just in the minimal dark photon model, the dark photon doesn't have much in the way of uh, any cosmologically relevant lifetime. It decays away quickly. The lifetime can be relevant for collider experiments. So there can actually be a displacement in that decay. And that's interesting, and Natalia will talk about that. And then below an MeV, as you go to lower and lower masses, the lifetime just grows and can be cosmologically long-lived for low enough mass, um, where it can be, in principle, a dark matter candidate. OK, so that's the minimal dark photon model. Any questions so far? Next thing I'm going to talk about are motivations for the quantitative parameters that we often think about in these minimal models. Okay, so a question you should ask is, right, we have epsilon, it's this dimension four, dimensionless coupling that we can think about. What's a reasonable scale to consider? Order one, 10 to the minus 50. I mean, what's, what's reasonable? Perfectly good question. Likewise, what's an interesting range to think about for the mass of the vector? And again, just to emphasize, these are just parameters. So a priori, I mean, these are not calculable parameters in this minimal a prime model, OK? They're not calculable. So in principle, we should just set them and get them from experiment. But there are a couple of assumptions that are very plausible that we could imagine where some of these parameters, and in particular epsilon, would have a UV boundary condition where it would vanish. Um, and that, for example, is very natural in the context of grand unified models. But those are by no, by no means the only type. So if, say, a U1 hypercharge lives in some gut at a high scale, that would imply that epsilon should be zero um, deep, in the, deep in the UV. And so the picture we should have is we've got our UV scale. Very large, epsilon is zero. We have some new physics that kicks in. At some scale that I won't even won't even name. That is presumably associated with breaking the gut. It's charged under both the U1 dark and the U1 hypercharged subgroup of the gut. And then we have low energy scales. And the basic question we want to ask is, if, if primordially, 
And I don't mean that in the sense of time. I mean that in the sense of UV. If in the UV theory, epsilon is zero because there's some underlying symmetry structure that, pre that prevents it from being non-zero, say, at tree level, but then you break that underlying symmetry structure, in this case, a gut, what kind of magnitude of coupling would you get from new physics potentially associated with this breaking? Can we estimate it, just to sort of give our sense of, a sense of scale? Go ahead. Uh, why does there have to be some kind of symmetry breaking happening here? There doesn't have to be. We're just looking for a reason why epsilon would be small in the UV, or zero, in fact, even. Okay? Because, in, again, it's not, a, it's not a calculable parameter. So in the absence of any reason, you might set, you know, why wouldn't it be you know, one, or just order one? So there's, there's, no, there's no, no reason, sorry, there's no, um, there's no logical reason why there has to be underlying symmetry structure at a high scale, but it would provide an explanation for that boundary condition. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that estimate. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. <sighs> okay. I am really sorry. Part of it is just like. Yeah, I know. Maybe I should actually just like clean the boards as we go. <laughs> I don't know. All right. I'll, I'll write bigger and bolder if I can. All right. So let's consider. So heavy phi. So phi is going to be. Uh, it's going to be a degree of freedom that carries charge qi. So it has, I'll call it matter. It could be scalar for me on, but it's heavy is the point. Matter with QI charge under U1 dark and capital Q charge under U1 hypercharge, okay? All right. Okay, so in the presence of heavy degrees of freedom that are charged under both the U1 hypercharge subgroup, sorry, the, the U1 hypercharge group and then U1 dark, there is going to be a loop level correction that generates a kinetic mixing term. Go ahead. We're going to estimate a scale for epsilon. Okay. So there's the following diagram, which is to have loops of the phi's with A. Okay. That diagram, let me go over to the center board, because I want to write a formula. And I'm worried you guys aren't going to be able to see it here. Okay. So there's an obligatory loop level effect that the presence of any heavy new physics charged under both U1 dark and U1 hypercharge will induce, it'll induce a kinetic term, okay? So this operator will be induced by this loop effect where epsilon 
in this case. Now, we, I can put an equal sign here, um, but I'm going, I'm going to, uh, well, I'll start with an equal sign. So there's a G hypercharge. There's a G dark over 16 pi squared. So the GY is from this side. The G dark is from that side. And then there's always a sum over products of charges. And then there's a logarithm. All right, so here mu is the renormalization scale. Okay, so the point here is that we're dealing with a dimension four operator, which means that new physics at any scale, arbitrary high mass scale, that has the appropriate coupling structure, in this case just talks to the two U1s, can just be integrated out and it could generate this operator that survives now to low energies. And the loop level scale for epsilon that you would, you would guess from, from this kind of structure is, well, it's just the couplings times a loop factor times a log of the uh, mass squared relative to the renormalization scale. So here I've actually just set it up so that at a scale set by that heavy mass scale, epsilon would just, would just be zero. That would be the boundary condition that satisfies here. And this would naively give epsilons in the 10 to the minus, I'll call it 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 4 range. So for typical G darks, so we do have to say something about G dark. I'm just going to set that to order one, but in principle, I mean, that is a parameter in here. Epsilon of order 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 4 uh, is a natural one loop expectation for um, integrating out heavy physics. And again, you know, the precise scale at which this new physics kicks in is not so important. It's only logarithmically sensitive to that. Okay. Now, early on in the resurgence of interest in dark sectors, um, this, played an, this observation played an important role in the field. Just this idea that just generic, one, you know, integrating out new physics at any scale, the one loop effects would give you an epsilon in this 10 to the minus 3 range, say. Um, that was interesting to a lot of people because um, that would have simultaneously put such dark photons largely out of the reach of many existing experimental constraints from colliders, but within reach of relatively straightforward experiments that could be done and relevant to a whole host of, of things that were coming up in the data at the time, things like the G minus 2 anomaly and so forth. So historically, this fact played an important role just in people's thinking about how reasonable this all was, this whole setup. Now, it doesn't have to be in this range. I motivated the epsilon equals zero boundary condition from a, from, a, from, a, from a grand unified theory, and I skipped over an important point here, which is that actually, in the absence of gut breaking, you wouldn't generate this term, okay? And just to see that, uh, I'm going to leave this here. If we were to take this motivation very seriously, that it's a that it's a gut that's responsible for this epsilon equals zero boundary condition, as opposed to some other types of explanations. I mean, there's other explanations we can concoct, especially in an extra dimensional context. But in this specific case of 
putting the U1 inside a gut. Then the sum of the charges in the multiplet needs to be zero. And in particular, these loop integrals, sorry, these, uh, these loop level effects all vanish in the absence of gut breaking. And so actually, the leading order effects in that context, they actually don't come in at one loop. They come in at one loop times a gut breaking effect. So they'll be even smaller than one loop. So let me just illustrate that. First, actually, it's a little, just to, just to kind of give you a rough idea of why it's zero, if you go back to this formula, if you pick a, uh, a multiplet, like if you imagine that you have a, if you imagine that phi is a gut multiplet that couples uniformly to the A prime, um, that means that then the, the masses of the individual particles in that multiplet are the same, and then the sum of charge condition will lead to a cancellation of these effects. Alternatively, you could actually write this as a sum of logarithms, where instead of the renormalization scale appearing, it's a ratio of different mass terms in the multiplet, but if they're then the same, you just have a log of one everywhere, and it's just zero. Go ahead. It doesn't actually matter much, right? It's only logarithmically sensitive. So if you, if you, you're right, you see, like, okay, does that, okay. Yeah. Anything else? Go ahead. Yeah, so what, what has to happen here, in the absence of gut breaking, um, this would be talking to the gut gauge groups. I mean, that's another way. If you wanted to write, you could decompose it as a diagram involving the, the generator that generates U and hypercharge, and then you have loops of the multiplet. You could think of it that way. And then, and then the fact that you get zero is just coming from, this, from these cancellation of effects that I just mentioned. Another way to think about it, though, is that it's just you have a non-abelian term that you can't couple to an abelian term if you want to think of it that way before gut breaking. Um, okay, all of this is to say that Oops, I did not mean to erase that. Let's go back here. Okay, so with gut breaking, the different states in the multiplet typically are broken. So these could be like X or Y gauge bosons that are appearing that you have to then add to the loop that then split the masses of these states. But all we care about is that you generate a splitting. These splittings are typically of order some mass scale times their own loop factor, which are things like, again, this is loop level gut breaking, where you have a loop factor of the X and Y gauge boson gauge couplings times some overall mass scale, that sets the mass splitting of these multiplets. If, and in that case, the epsilon that you get, schematically, and I'm gonna just put a tilde here because I don't wanna, because frankly, a, a, a strictly true equation with equal signs doesn't convey any more content than the, than the tilde form, okay? You have the one loop factor that we had before. You have your charges Q. And then you end up with a log. You end up with logs of mi over mj squareds, which would have been one in the absence of breaking, which would have made this zero. But with breaking, We can write these as logs one plus schematically. I'm going to write this as order g x y gauge boson squared over 16 pi squared. These ratios, right? They're close to one. They only differ by these loop factors. And so then you can expand the log, and you see that the natural scale you get for kinetic mixing in that case 
is your loop factor times your gut breaking uh, effects, which are themselves loop factor in this, in this particular case. So you can easily get a two loop scale for epsilon. Okay? So one loop, gut breaking, implies epsilon in the 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 8 for natural, you know, for typical, um, for typical g dark, you know, gxys, et cetera. So I'm not trying to derive like precise equations. I'm trying to derive parametric relations, right? So this naive integrate out a heavy particle, you get a one loop effect for epsilon. If you really take the gut idea seriously, you would have to include gut breaking, and then that should show up as well. And so then actually the natural expectation for epsilon is that it's smaller than one loop. Now in some models, the gut breaking actually isn't done at loop level. There's other effects like an orbifold guts where it's boundary terms. And then the gut breaking shows up as like some order one boundary effect divided by a volume factor. And that's, that itself is a small number. So it doesn't have to be a loop factor. But this motivates a smaller range of epsilons. Now it turns out for this range of epsilons uh, in the minimal dark photon model, when I was referring to prompt decays and collider experiments, when you get down to epsilons that small, these decays start having displacement, okay? So all of this is to say that kind of top-down naive guesses for the scale of epsilon would put you into the sort of 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 8 range, which actually spans both the prompt and displaced decay range of dark photons and experiments, and easily puts you into a range where the dark photon is cosmologically long-lived if it's very light below the MUV scale. Okay. This is just to give you an idea. Any question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, could these uh, UVH bosons have any coupling to the standard model themselves? Uh, in the case of guts, they absolutely do. I mean, they're, right, so you're embedding the standard model in a, in a larger gauge group. And so, so you'll often have, so these, these at, again, at a high scale, when these gauge bosons are around, they'll couple to the standard model trees of freedom. OK, next thing, what about? The mass scale, MA prime. Where do we put it? Go ahead. So you cannot appeal to models where you have heavy states like this that can give rise to one or two loop effects. So you have, you have, to, you have to build models where those states don't, aren't, aren't there to do that. So I guess what I'm wondering and, is, yeah. So there, I mean, there are models where you can have, especially in, I mean, so, okay. I'll include references to the dark photon literature so that you can look, look up some of these. But in the, in the context of extra dimensions, you can get exponentially suppressed epsilons that essentially come from like, you have like two brains, you have a bulk, standard model lives in one place, you have the dark one that lives in another place, and then you have a wave function overlap that includes a warp factor that can be exponentially small that overlaps with the other brain, and then you can get very, very tiny epsilons that way. Just, I mean, that's just like a schematic picture to have in your head. Um, but that, that setup is what I just said, right? There's no new degrees of freedom that live where the standard model does that, that talk to both the U1 dark and the U1 hypercharge that you can integrate out to get that. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to have to finish the discussion of mass scales next time. I'm going to start, though, here. The first thing to say is that by itself, in the, for just a U1 with a mass term, we don't need to say anything further about its UV completion. There's no bad UV behavior which, you know, for example, in the case of the standard model with a, non with a spontaneously broken non-abelian gauge symmetry and its matter content, there are scattering processes that have bad UV behavior that you have to cure in some manner. One way of doing that is to introduce a Higgs. That is not required in this model, okay? Um, sometimes these are just referred to as uh, Stuckelberg mass models, 
where we don't need to have anything analogous to a Higgs boson to give rise to it. So that's fine. And there's a decent chunk of the literature that assumes that. But the other interesting possibility is that the mass term does arise from a spontaneous breaking of the U1 dark. And that carries its own phenomenological implications. And it, there's a set of motivations for it. Um, of course, it doesn't have to involve a fundamental Higgs. You could have new dark sector strong dynamics that does this. I mean, there's actually a range of possibilities. There was a flurry of model building activity in, I'm going to say 2009, 10, and 11, so a while ago, decade ago, that looked at the origin of mass scales in dark sectors kinetically mixed with the standard model. And most of this model building was done in the context of low energy supersymmetry. The reason for that is A, that low energy supersymmetry is by far, you know, at least 10 years ago it was, the most popular beyond the standard model extension. It accommodates unification. It evolved, addresses the hierarchy problem. It has dark matter candidates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in that context, if you have a dark sector sequestered from the standard model and SUSY breaking is occurring on the standard model side, what you would naively expect then is to have an approximately supersymmetric dark sector that's coupled to the standard model. Okay? And that largely resolves issues of hierarchy problems when you think about new scalars that might be, you know, new scalar matter that might be in there and so forth. Now, it's, you know, the 2020s. Um, I don't think there has been that much discussion of supersymmetric model building in this, in the TASI school this year. And I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to, to get into it, but we can, I'm happy to come back to it in later lectures. What I want to do is write down non-supersymmetric models that have the key ingredients from these models to illustrate just the parametrically how these mass scales can arise below the weak scale in particular. And the basic punchline is that these models have one new ingredient, which is you have something like you have a scalar particle in the dark sector. I'm going to call it a dark Higgs. And it couples to our Higgs through the Higgs portal, which I wrote down earlier today, right? Through one of, it's a, one of the few operators you can use to communicate scalars and the standard model. And the supersymmetry of these models is important in justifying that all of these interaction terms occur through marginal dimension four operators alone. Okay? So with that said, let me just write down the sort of most important ingredients of a toy model to illustrate how a spontaneous breaking of the U1 dark can occur. And then we'll probably stop for today. Now this isn't that complicated. Um, so we'll introduce an HD, called HD, which will be the dark Higgs. So this is a complex scalar. OK, just to remind you, uh, so we'll have so the covariant derivative that we write, just so I can the notation here, we have del mu minus i. We have our g dark. A prime mu, HD, and the Lagrangian in this simple model, where all the interactions are just specified by dimensionless couplings, so just dimension four operators, is the kinetic term. For the dark Higgs, there's a Cordic term for the dark Higgs. And then there's a Higgs portal coupling. Now, again, this structure, in a non supersymmetric context, this is not singled out. Um, this is inspired by the structure of these minimal SUSY models. 
the way of saying it here is that this is the this is the model singled out by the requirement that the interactions are just at dimension four. Okay? So everything's dimensionless. So here's the Higgs portal. Okay, now in the supersymmetric context, this Higgs portal coupling actually arises from what's known as um, D term mixing that's associated with the supersymmetric version of kinetic mixing. And even at tree level, you're guaranteed to then get a coupling of this form where kappa is actually proportional to epsilon, the kinetic mixing parameter. There are other terms that I'm leaving out, but that, is, that comes along for the ride in the supersymmetric context. Now, without Susie, of course, you might have naively guessed that because this is a dark sector coupling to the standard model sector, just like we did for the kinetic mixing estimates, you might naively guess that a reasonable expectation would be for kappa to also be at the one loop or the two loop level if it comes from integrating out heavy states charged into the two sectors. Either way, in your own mind, you should think of kappa here as parametrically similar scale as epsilon. It's going to be small. Go ahead. Is there some quick way to understand why kappa would be proportional to uh, epsilon in this? Quick. Or is that? Let me think about whether there's a quick way. Okay. Now, what happens here is you can sort of see just from the structure of this toy model, electroweak symmetry breaking for kappa less than zero. So this is if that operator has a negative sign. So for kappa less than zero, electroweak breaking Electroweak break, electro breaking triggers um, U1 dark breaking. Okay. Right, so if we take the standard model Higgs to its VEV, so this is the SU2 cross U1 breaking, I just said. Then we see that we pick up a negative soft mass for the dark Higgs, and that's going to destabilize its potential. And I will, I think by now most people have gone through the sort of minimal Higgs model, so you know the parametrics of this well. That's all this is. The dark Higgs will then acquire a VEV that will spontaneously break U1 dark, and you'll end up with a mass of the dark photon that'll be controlled by kappa. Okay. So the VEV this guy will just be kappa V squared over lambda. The mass of the dark Higgs in this vacuum is just magnitude of kappa times v squared. So recall again, you know, v is the order of the weak scale. Right, this was the Higgs VEV. And this implies ma prime squared equals g dark squared kappa v squared over lambda. Okay, so the picture here, the picture is that we have W and Z bosons that are parametrically set by standard model couplings times the Higgs VEV. 
And then we have MA prime, which is parametrically set by the square root of, I'm just going to call it kappa, times v. And I've, I'm suppressing lambdas and g darks, because I'm just trying to single out the small parameter. OK. So this is much less than v. Go ahead. Um, do we know that the dark Higgs band uh, has to be stable or at least metastable? Well, so in, these toy, in, the, in this toy model, of, it's going to be stable by virtue of the quartic coupling. All right, so this is more or less, just at the moving parts level, how the hierarchy of scales gets generated in a relatively broad class of models where you have approximate supersymmetry. Without that, of course, um, you could still build a non-supersymmetric model. You can write it down. It's totally fine. But if you have any new physics at high scales, that can introduce UV sensitivity that will give rise to large dimension two and three operators that could spoil this. That's fine. But at just the level of, of this setup, we have the weak scale, we have electroweak symmetry breaking, and then we have mass scales that are the square root of this kappa, which we were envisioning to be either one loop or two loop. And if you put in numbers for one loop, the square root of one loop is, say, 10 to the minus 2. So if you have weak scale at 100 jev, that's A prime masses in the GeV range. If you had two loop effects, that's A prime masses in the sort of MeV to GeV range. OK? So this broad class of simple, of simple models that realize electroweak symmetry breaking triggering dark breaking motivate scales underneath the weak scale. And that was, that's sort of the main punchline here for these early, for uh, this discussion of the minimal dark photon model with a Higgs. So any questions here? Because the next step is going to be to go to move on with the minimal dark photon model with the dark Higgs, and then we're going to start to get into dark matter. Go ahead. Sorry. So if you have, if you had, it doesn't have to be. It can be heavier. So the, t the one loop range would say 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 4. On the 10 to the minus 4 end, if I take the square root of that. Yeah, but it doesn't matter, right? You know, I'm, I'm supposed to get like some new degrees of freedom and like whatever, below the electric scale, right? That's the whole point. So, so I can, like, I don't constrain this whole point by just looking for the heavy degrees of freedom, right? Can you not do that? Like, what am I I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. GEV, did you say? Uh, EV scale, right? Like, EV, oh, EV, whatever. Much lighter, okay. You, you take your scale, okay. Yeah. There are interesting searches for them, and there are certainly constraints. And there's a lot of opportunities in upcoming experiments to cover a lot of the remaining ground. But for even one loop mixings, cap of order 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 4, there's a lot of open ground there. So it's, it's like, OK, so the way you always think of this dark model is that you, you uh, constrain epsilon, the mixing, to this many months. But now here, you need to also constrain this cap yep. as a function of like. Yep. So, so this, what this motivates, right? So this, so this whole discussion is about estimating reasonable scales for epsilon and the dark photon mass. This is an estimate that comes from models where spontaneously break U1 dark, and it's particularly inspired by the sort of supersymmetric sectors. And the minimal model that you get from this now has a dark photon and a dark Higgs. And you have to include the dark Higgs in the phenomenology, and that's what we're going to do. Go ahead. Uh, 
you know, most of the strong constraints come from the from not from not the direct couplings to the dark Higgs. They actually they still come from just the, the direct searches for the A prime. The reason for that is that in these minimal models, the dark Higgs doesn't have a very direct coupling to standard model matter. Okay, so you still the leading order coupling is still a dark photon coupling to standard model currents. And then the probably most important interaction term in the abelian dark Higgs models is, is the dark Higgs vector vector coupling. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll talk more about this. Go ahead. I'm sorry, let me go back to the question. So you just asked about looking for the dark Higgs in accelerator experiments as well. So, so you can use the Higgs portal operator to constrain this as well. And 10 to the minus two would be problematic for that, okay? Just to be, just to be clear. You have to, go to the lower, you have to go to the lower end of that range for this to work. Now the lower end of that range is what's favored for kind of lower mass dark sectors anyway. But I, I do wanna just make sure not to over miss that point here. Maybe that's what you were referring to. Okay, let's coming back. So you can include a you can include a soft mass term, just a direct one, and that's that's fine. Um, and then it's just a question of what scale it has. So if it's smaller than the weak scale, then this portal term after electroweak symmetry breaking can dominate over it. If it's much larger than the weak scale, then you can just integrate out the Higgs, and it's like it's not even there. I mean, there's no you're not going to have a spontaneous breaking. Effect. Okay, anything else? We are at lunch here. So let's go ahead and stop there. Well, I don't know if it would be any better, but I just got some of this chalk, which we can try. Actually, what I think, what I think will, um, I actually, I like the big chalk, it's all fine. You like it? What I think, I don't know if the, even I have trouble seeing, once I erase the boards, Yeah. That's, that's the main issue. <laughs> have, other, have other lecturers had that issue? I feel like it hasn't, it, it's been somewhat difficult, but somehow it seems worse now. Were they using this chalk? Before. Some of them might have been. So because the issue seems to be that I can't erase it without, yeah. I use this chalk the clean in my office. It's, the, it's once it's been, yeah. Well, tomorrow I'll switch to this. This is what I normally use anyway. And I don't feel like I normally have this problem. Just at my own board. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. If you write big, people can see all the way across, so there will be some drifting back and forth. Maybe the people on the front row will have issues. I'm not. One thing we could do. What, what um, I did do. I did do one thing, which is I got a box of this Japanese hey. chalk that people question. like. Yeah. Okay. So, um, with, okay. So, Some so other which is I this? understand like the, the way you like you just you're giving us like a generic idea of how to do it. So I was just wondering, like you, you said that how to generate the epsilon in, in like your card modified model. Can I also do the same thing with the mass like in that model, not here? Like it seems to me like there are, I need like two different ingredients to generate like epsilon and the mass. But can I can I get it like let's say my my yeah, so, is only got like So you could do, if you wanted to do if you wanted to do the like you know, the kinds of models that people would have thought about 10 years ago. You have standard model, it ha and it unifies at some scale. You have a dark sector. You have supersymmetry to remove any UV issues. Okay, so the dark sector is approximately supersymmetric. SUSY breaking will occur on the standard model side. But even before you break SUSY, the usual picture is you break the gut at a high scale. And then, and then, there's, a, so then there's a story for how the kinetic mixing, the supersymmetric kinetic mixing gets generated, which is totally analogous to what I just wrote down. We can, we can, I could tell the whole story the exact same way, but now talking about super multiplets instead of normal fields. But in that case, like, I'll, I'll define it to the, the whole uh, Susie. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Then I need to at some point integrate out them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then what, what happens, and these models are all more complicated for that reason. Because now what you have is you have kinetic mixing of a supersymmetric dark sector with a, with a supersymmetric standard model and all the accoutrements that involves. And then you break Susie. Okay, and so then the heavy states get integrated out, and then you have to look at what's left over at low mass. And what typically happens, in the supersymmetric context, you don't have one Higgs. In the supersymmetric context, the simplest thing you do is you add, you add a vector-like matter multiplet, 
So just so, so it's just a chiral superfield that's vector-like into the U1 dark. That has two Higgses in it. It has two scalars, two complex scalars. Now they come with opposite charges. And what happens is the kinetic mixing term, that's the supersymmetric kinetic mixing term, gives you a D term mixing in the potential for those scalars. Okay? And you get an, an after electroweak symmetry breaking, you get an effective uh, Fayat Elepolis term. And that destabilizes one of those two directions. So one of those, there's a linear combination of those complex scalars that's guaranteed to get a VEV. Okay, because, and, that, and that's because the supersymmetric, that's because the hit dark sector started out approximately supersymmetric. There's extra ingredients to these models. So you typically, all these models have mu problems, just like the standard model does. You have a mu, 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 mu problem. So you have to say something about that. The simplest versions that solve that have a singlet. Okay.